I usually don't write my speeches out, but, um, or at least not in full, but what I'm going to be talking about today is both so important to me and also so complex that I actually scripted the speech. I will go off script at times, but I felt like this is a moment, a historical moment, where we need to really take a pause and assess where we are as a nation. So, forthwith. I was thrilled to be asked to speak at the Power of Narrative Conference at a time when narrative is nothing more or less than a distillate of the human heart and soul. What I mean by that is that we're a nation at war. There are wars of blood and death, others of disinformation, data breaches, and cyber attacks. And years after I thought they'd faded, Cold Wars fought primarily through diplomacy. But the thread that connects them all is narrative. One person's glorious leader is another's aggressor. One person's liberator is another's rogue actor. To a greater and greater degree, no war can be won without narrative first emerging that supports its victory. The wars of narratives are wars for hearts and souls and minds. As a subset of narrative storytelling, journalism can be an instrument of either liberation or obfuscation. That is true of the war to reshape and rebuild American journalism as well. I say American journalism because that's what I'm going to drill down on today, but be clear that the news generated in the United States has a global force just as America does. Our time together is short. I want it to be meaningful. I'm going to start out by telling you about my time on the road covering, among other things, six presidential elections. I'll also explore why the body I inhabit and my personal history are critical to the work I do. Then I'll explain how the journalistic world I've inhabited is missing important voices, both within the ranks of storytellers and how we approach the stories of this nation, and why that puts the journalism industry and our very democracy in peril. Finally, I'm going to move into talking about solutions, ways we can take what we've learned and stop repeating the same mistakes, instead elevating the public discourse and enriching our lives. With the 2020 election and the census right around the corner, there's no better time for us to become better, more probing, more inclusive storytellers than right now. Our very nation depends on it. So this is me on election night 2016. Um, after about three or four hours on air on ABC Digital uh, with host Amna Nawaz on the left, uh, we got to watch the Electoral College uh, play out and I had a fascinating seat watching this all in real time, but of course this wasn't my first rodeo. This was my first rodeo, 1996 on CNN, and I was on with the woman on the right, Kellyanne. Uh, I tweeted this out when I found it in my storage locker. Me, Jonathan Carl, and Kellyanne Fitzpatrick, now Conway, before she believed in alternative facts. <laughs> so now I'm going to start with my origin story. I was born into journalism. My mother and father met when they were grad students at Syracuse's School of Communications. Before I was born, they lived in Zambia. In fact, they returned when my mother was seven months pregnant with me. Um, she was almost turned back for being too far along to fly. I grew up in two stages, the New York years and the Baltimore years. Um, and before I tell you about that, that's me um, with the inappropriately short dress. And, <laughs> In, Z in Zimbabwe on my first visit there, my mom behind me holding my younger sister. Um, this is a picture of my grandfather and his brothers. And I'm going to get a little bit into the Baltimore years right here. So I grew up in two stages, the New York years and the Baltimore years. And I, I, again, I'm going to self-plagiarize from another essay I wrote. The summer before I entered first grade, my family moved from Central Park West and 100th Street to a virtually all-black neighborhood in Baltimore. In New York, my friends were not just black and white. My best friend was half black and half Jewish. My extended friend circle included multiracial Cuban American girls, um, blonde kids, Asian. It was all very free to be you and me. When we moved to Baltimore to a tree-lined street of 1920s and 1930s era wooden houses near the city line, I was plunged into a world where there was only blackness and whiteness, and the two were engaged in a fierce cold war. 
This dislocation, relocation meant that by the age of six, I had laid out some of my fundamental principles and psychology that remains with me today and that has shaped my perspective as a journalist. First, I came to believe that humans lived in reality zones with quite different rules about identity, fairness, and achievement. Inside these zones, there was an internally coherent reality. But when you crossed the zones, you began to see that uh, the rules changed entirely. Second, what I learned was that whiteness, which was inconsequential to my early childhood, was of paramount importance to understand for my survival. Third, that these reality zones could be crossed and you could remain self-aware of how you were being perceived by others as well as how you perceived those around you. The psychological adjustment to a new reality zone steered me towards being a journalist in later life as much as my parents' backgrounds did. I became a student at an early age of American cultures, plural. My family gave me two messages that have held me in good stead. One, that I could do anything. And two, there would be people who tried to stop me from doing it. They would try to stop me because of the body I lived in and the cultural, political, and historic implications of my being a free woman of color. I was made to understand that my very existence was troubling to some people, but I should not let that curtail my quest to live freely and with mission and purpose. And now that I've set the stage for how I came into existence, you know, this is my favorite Thanksgiving photo of my family. Love them. Um, now that I've set the scene for, scene for how I came into existence, physically, intellectually, and culturally, let me drill down on a part of the story that I've never really told before. I've tried so very hard over the years to convince people that my mind was worthy of the challenge of reporting on our vast nation, but I've also come to believe that my body is a critical part of the work I do. In Ta-Nehisi Coates' best-selling book, Between the World and Me, the word body appears more than 300 times. He talks about the ways that the black body in America is controlled, constrained, and abused, and also how we seek freedom. Living in a black body, specifically a black female body, has made me a better reporter. I've had to work harder to build trust with my interview subjects and slow down the pace of how I interview. I will often spend 20 minutes talking with people about their personal hobbies or their families before asking any substantive questions. The fact that the body I live in makes it challenging for me to do my chosen profession has made me better at what I do. I chose the title of this speech, Alone in America with You, because I've spent years on the road, often alone as a black woman, sometimes interviewing white nationalists and supremacists or other people whose worldviews I did not share, but who I was compelled to treat fairly in my reporting. And even when traveling with a team, there's an aspect of aloneness to being a reporter. You have to stand alone in your physical body, no matter what gender or race, and deal with people's conceptions of who you are when they meet you. You have to both show the knowledge you have and the humility of what you don't know, and you have to stand alone in many ways with some ultimate confidence that the narrative you depict is truthful. Both the physical and editorial aloneness are part of doing the work and part of the narrative of what it takes to be a reporter. For example, for my 1999 book, The Color of Our Future, I went alone into a church which had threatened to disinter the body of a mixed race baby from its all white cemetery. I spoke to the baby's grandparents, visited their trailer home, noticed how many of the trailers had been damaged by storms, a sign of the economic distress of the region. They told me that they used to fly the Confederate flag over the trailer, but seeing their dead baby grandchild disrespected so profoundly over race had changed their minds about that. That entire trip remains emblazoned on my mind, just like the time I went into a Klansman's house for a television story in the late 90s, or before that, when I did a story on women in the white supremacist movement. Um, oh, this is, this is political reporting has no place here. We will keep, we will keep moving. Um, I'll go back to some of those slides. So this is a story that I did in 1994. It's called uh, Women Who Love to Hate. And I spoke with women in the Klan, the Aryan Nation, other white supremacist groups, including a woman who had escaped after being forced to be a child bride in a white supremacist cult. When I reported this, I was in my early 20s. And so through a Klansman I had interviewed, I got the chance to speak to a woman in his clavern. That's Klan for local meeting group, by the way. In any case, they wanted me to meet them at a park and ride in Frederick, Maryland. I didn't want to go alone. 
So I asked my friend Thomas, who's a white southerner from a rural area, to go with me. He didn't hesitate to accompany me, accompany me but he did say, Farai, the Klan doesn't like race mixing, meaning if I thought it was safe as a black woman because I brought my white road dog along, it might actually antagonize them rather than protecting me. I still brought Thomas with me and I have to thank him to this day for, for being my road dog. So what happened was, what happened was, the day that we were scheduled to meet, there was a blizzard. Schools were closed, roads were closed, many of them, uh, but we were supposed to meet in a very well-traveled area. Uh, as it turned out, instead of meeting in a busy public place full of people, on the post-blizzard uh, afternoon, we met these white supremacists in an empty, snow-covered parking lot. I call it my white-on-white -white interview. And by the way, no one told me how to protect myself while doing this kind of reporting. I had to figure it out for myself. I put my physical and emotional safety at risk year after year because I saw that there were stories that needed telling that few others were doing. In any case, uh, once I got to the parking lot, this woman's husband had a handgun-shaped bulge under his camo overalls, which my friend pointed out to me when we arrived, like a good road dog would. And still I persisted. I got the interview. The woman, Robin, told me that she didn't want her kids growing up around black people in the low-income apartment complex where she lived. She wanted them to be able to live in an all-white neighborhood. She had bad teeth, something author Sarah Smarsh has pointed out are a huge class signifier in America. She was white and she was poor. She struck me as more sad than angry, although obviously an outlet for anger is one of the things that the Klan offers its members. It also struck me that fundamentally she didn't have a race problem, at least not in the sense that she was looking at it. She had a money problem. There are all white neighborhoods all around America. She just couldn't afford to move to one. Despite the obvious differences in the worldview between us, I found room for empathy. She wanted the best for her kids. Okay, I can get down with that. But she was stuck on race as a remedy instead of asking why someone in her income bracket couldn't live well in America and why America couldn't provide her family with an on-ramp to the dream. Understanding Robin's worldview has helped me understand the long history of race as a wedge between working class people who share common interests. One cannot cover America without understanding the historical and contemporary ways that race has been used to polarize and divvy up power. And yet, in 2016, more than two decades after I reported this story, the mainstream journalism industry pretended it had no idea that race was a thing in politics. Flash forward to 2015. At the beginning of the election cycle, I wrote a mild-mannered article about the use of racial dog whistles in the election. My editor called me into the office on my day off, accused me of cherry-picking facts to fit my thesis, and asked why I had come to work there. Mind you, they had recruited me a month ago. If he'd bothered to pick up any book on political history, he would have seen that not only was I not cherry picking facts, I was flagging what would later become a dominant theme of the election. He came around to see that about a year later. That interaction was just one of many moments where I realized that I am presumed not only less qualified, but less rational because of my race or gender. I am asked not to see what I see because it doesn't fit with others uh, you know, who are from the majority culture on the staff see. In those cases, the majority's gaze is presumed to be the correct gaze, and those who have a different gaze are presumed to be emotional, obsessed with injustice, holding a grudge, or simply incorrect. Meanwhile, during the election, I was corresponding with a white nationalist on Twitter and getting some of the inside scoop on the movement. He liked my reporting for 538. He followed my Twitter account. I saw his profile, which was clearly alt-right, and I followed him back. He said, hey, you should know I'm a white nationalist. And I said, that's precisely why I followed you. <laughs> and that's why we began more, of, more than a year of intense correspondence. I learned so much from our interactions. He went to Charlottesville, and this is from Charlottesville, and when he returned, he was so hyped up and manic that I saw the, how the bloodlust had affected him. He, in, in, uh, affected him. He was engorged with the rage all around him, and I had never seen that in his correspondence before. 
So let me say this, when America's news editors say that they missed the rise of white nationalism in politics and extremism in America, that's not quite true. They didn't miss it, they ignored it. And those are two entirely different things. White supremacist extremism is the number one cause of domestic terrorism, something we're only beginning to cover with the attention it deserves. Another example of what shocked the world of journalism, but shouldn't have, was the rise of politically weaponized anti-Mexican xenophobia. In 2010, I interviewed Sheriff Joe Arpaio for a series of radio documentaries I produced, and that's Sheriff Joe sitting at his desk. Arpaio said he wanted to send troops into Mexico. I asked him to clarify, and he reiterated that he, a sheriff, not a federal agent, wanted to send his celebrity militia, including actor Steven Seagal, into Mexico, along with professional troops, of course. The Mexican rapist playbook that candidate Donald Trump used was perfected by Arpaio, who spent 24 years in elected office, uh, even once the department he even once the department he ran was cited for racially profiling Latinos and he was convicted of contempt of court for not following orders to stop violating civil rights. His department also misspent $99.5 million, by the way. Now, I was not shocked when, President, uh, when candidate Trump's poll numbers went up after his high-profile anti-Mexican rally in September of 2016. Um, that was the night that, uh, after he'd met the Mexican president. Nor was I surprised that Arpaio became the first pardon granted by President Trump. It's a case of pattern recognition. I saw the patterns that were emerging throughout the election because I was paying attention to them. So why did so many esteemed news reporters and editors miss the biggest culture war of our era? Well, many newsroom leaders in our profession weren't living in the war zone, they were living in the green zone. Most of the reporters of color I know were living through this culture war even as we were reporting it. At night, instead of going home to the green zone, a metaphor for relative safety, we went home to neighborhoods where we could see the race, class, and gender wars in America raging. Now, I personally live in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, which is a rapidly gentrifying, but for the moment, majority non-white, heavily immigrant neighborhood. I live in a large pre-war building with amazing people who share their lives with me. I've talked to one of my neighbors who's an undocumented immigrant about how she lost her property in her home country because she didn't want to leave her US born daughter and settled the dispute with her ex-husband. She works around the clock doing nursing care five days a week for a wealthy elderly white client. She has survived cancer and works hard to take care of her health. She has a haunted look in her eyes, yet a fierce determination as well. Others of my neighbors who are Haitian born are now in legal limbo because the current administration is trying to revoke the means by which they are here called temporary protected status. It's all being batted around in the courts. Imagine living with that every day, not knowing whether or not your legal status will be revoked. And yet another set of neighbors is considering moving to Europe where the husband of the family is from, if the de facto caste system of US school districts puts their children's education at risk. The people who I live with, the people who I see every day, live in the culture war in a profound way that I wouldn't see if I lived, let's say, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan or in many of the suburbs. Now, some other reporters could leave America's trials and tribulations behind when they went home in my home life, uh, like that of most reporters I know, was just another space for us to exchange information about the upheavals. And, you know, I would add that it's not just, uh, this is a, a, a rally um, that, that uh, activists were trying to get Sheriff Joe Arpaio out. You can see the Basta Arpaio sign. Um, but I was by far not the only reporter to have a bunch of cognitive dissonance and to also experience unpleasantness on the road. I was um, verbally sexually harassed, which is still harassment, by a Trump supporter who I interviewed in Eastern Ohio. And I did not put it in the article where I interviewed him because it wasn't relevant to the story. I wrote about it later. And I mention that because I think that it is important to recognize that 
one of the superpowers, and I can't remember who originally said this, and, but it's not originally mine, one of the superpowers of journalism is not just what you put in, it's what you leave out. If I put in every time someone gave me a dirty look or you know, acted uh, like they were racially profiling me or did something untoward in a gender way towards me while I was reporting, my body of work would look very different. And so I made choices to preserve what the goal of my reporting was, which was to present an accurate picture of American society. And even though I have my own very strong political feelings, as you can tell, I never set out to stereotype anyone or any demographic, and I think that's really important. So I wanted to point to Asma Khalid, who is here in this photo. Uh, in a piece for NPR, um, and Asma and I collaborated on some podcasts that we did through the 538 stream because we were both political demo uh, demographic reporters. And so in a piece for NPR, Asma wrote about being a Muslim American woman on the campaign trail during a time of increasing anti-Muslim xenophobia. Her article begins, and this is strong stuff, Sometimes in, sometime in early 2016, between a Trump rally in New Hampshire where a burly man shouted something at me about being Muslim and a series of particularly vitriolic tweets that included some combination of raghead, terrorist, bitch, and jihadi, I went into my editor's office and wept. I cried for the first but not the last time this campaign season. Through the tears, I told her that if I had known my sheer existence, just the idea of being Muslim, would be a debatable issue in the 2016 election, I never would have signed up to do this job. To friends and family, I looked like a masochist, but I was too invested to quit. And those are the words of Asma Khalid of NPR. That's the level of dedication it takes to do this work. For any of you in this audience who are aspiring political reporters of color, know that you are needed and also that the road is covered with thorns. For any editors who think you can cover the country well without reporters of color or women or people who are working class in your newsroom, you can't. I've established that the journalism industry is not diverse in its ranks and it misses many important stories and trends, often when it overlooks the narrative surfaced by diverse staff. Our industry is also obsessed with traditional seats of power and misses the networked and distributed nature of power in this nation. The power of white supremacists, who I again have been covering for decades, is a great example of networked power. But so were the teachers who marched in states from West Virginia to Arizona to preserve education. And so were the indigenous and non-indigenous people who gathered at Standing Rock. Too often, America's elites are blindsided by the power of non-elite networks, where they have, which with they have little contact, which, which can reshape politics over the span of a decade or a day. This lack of connection to the grassroots is particularly acute as we see more and more communities becoming news deserts with little or no local coverage. So what can we do to change the narrative? First of all, we have to desegregate the American newsroom. I did a research paper for Harvard Shorenstein Center on race, gender, and the political press. My former colleague, Ben Castleman, gave me this nice shout out, uh, which also shows the uh, the report uh, from the Shorenstein Center. And so I was hoping to do a content analysis of whether more diverse newsrooms covered the election differently than less diverse ones. I actually had two conflicting hypotheses. One was that the diverse newsrooms would cover America differently, and two was that they wouldn't because very often dictates from the top down shape reporting as much as the lived experiences of the people in the newsroom. If you want to bring your whole self into the office, but your boss only wants a tiny little sliver of it, you're gonna produce the same stuff that everybody else, is, else produces. So I was not going into this with a presupposition. It was an actual inquiry. However, most of the news organizations did not even give me the numbers after two months of pestering different aspects of leadership, several people in each organization. And so you can see here, this is uh, from, for, uh, these are charts from my reporting um, for this Shorenstein research. A minority of them in green actually returned the numbers I wanted. A couple of returned other numbers that were pretty much irrelevant. Entire editorial staff, that's not what I was asking for. Most of them just refused. In one case, 
Someone called me and said, Farai, I really respect you and I like your work, but we're never giving you the numbers. This is off the record. I was like, okay, thanks. Um, so here is my breaking news. I am gonna do this project again, and I'm gonna do it by asking employees to provide the detailed data, not management. There are plenty of people in newsrooms who see the value of transparency. Um, so, you know, what if the crowdsource data is wrong? I will give every newsroom a chance to rebut, refute, and give the actual numbers. So stay tuned, we'll see how that goes. But in 2016, the New York Times only had 10% reporters of color. Um, Washington Post had 31%, NPR had 32%. Um, in terms of gender, the New York Times was also the lowest, 30% women, and um, NPR was the highest with 60% women on its political reporting team. Another solution is that we need to invest financially and with knowledge networks in a broader range of media makers. For the past 18 months, I've been the journalism program officer at the Ford Foundation. I get to help um, make decisions about the money that foundations use to fund civic media. But even though Ford's commitment to journalism is deep and longstanding, the amount of money we can apply to the problem makes only a small dent in the need. When I see larger scale efforts to rebuild journalism, whether for or nonprofit, there's often a sad shrug when asked how diversity and media equity fit into the picture. And just a brief definition of media equity, um, in my Shorenstein paper on the Kerner Commission report, which talked about the, the fact that the news media contributed to a divided America during the civil rights era, um, they get into the, the concept of media equity, um, that everyone deserves to be covered and everyone deserves to be covered fairly. You should not be stereotyped, nor should you be absent from news coverage. And one of the things that I'm doing at Ford with our media equity work is looking at media equity across the board. So that means that I'm also on the Rural Strategies Committee um, at Ford and working to resource work on newspapers in West Virginia, on news outlets in Indian country, on getting more working class white Americans back into the newsroom. The newsrooms in America used to be filled with working class white men. They have largely been pushed out for people who have higher socioeconomic status to start with and also people who've been able to get into Ivy League colleges and other elite universities. I think that we need the white working class to be covered well and also be represented in newsrooms. So when I talk about diversity, I'm not leaving out the white working class. I'm not leaving out rural Americans. I don't wanna leave out anyone. I just wanna make that clear. So the, the problem with media funding right now is that so many entities, both the for-profit and the non-profit side say, you know, we want to back the winners. But let me ask this, if you are rebuilding the same machine that already crumbled, how is that backing a winner? We need to innovate. We need to resource rural journalism. We need to resource diverse journalism. And we need to figure out ways of not rebuilding the same machine that crumbled in the first place. So third, one thing I think would help reporters is understanding that no one, literally no body, is without its own cultural signifiers. And rather than deny that, we reporters should take it into account. The default in mainstream journalism has, until recently and even today at most mainstream news organizations, been that a reporter was white, middle class or wealthier, heterosexual or heterosexual looking male. C, the fact that almost no women solo hosted political news shows until recent years with the late great Gwen Ifill being an exception. If you fit the white male class perceived sexuality bin, I expect it's pretty easy not to question how your physical embodiment affects the journalism you do most of the time. If you are a woman, a person of color, LGBTQ, et cetera, you may be more likely to ask, how would this interview or story have gone differently if I had been perceived differently by the people who I'm talking to? So I learned a lot of trust building techniques very early, like greeting certain people as sir or ma'am until they told me to stop, and if they didn't tell me to stop, I just kept doing it through the whole interview. White and male reporters can practice embodied reporting just as much as anyone else can. 
No matter what skin we live in, we have to understand that that skin has implications for our work. Finally, and most importantly, we need you. To use a Star Wars metaphor, journalism still thinks of itself as the resistance when often it's the empire. Our industry can produce an army of clones in terms of who we employ, who we give access to capital to become media owners and operators, and the content we produce. But clone narratives will not get us through this culture war. Authenticity, vulnerability, the willingness to engage with people who are in fact harmful to society, the willingness not to engage in a hagiography of the powerful, all of that will shape our future. The time in America and our world is half past urgent and the clock is ticking fast. So what kind of narratives do you want in your life? What are you prepared to know? Because if you don't want to know the truth, there's plenty out there to distract you. If you do, you need to work for it. You need to become a champion for knowledge. Um, I've outlined a number of solutions which have to do with the structural nature of journalism, but the biggest solution is you, discerning news consumers who care about democracy, care about the truth, and are willing to expand their comfort zone. No one publication or broadcast outlet is going to give you everything you need. One of your assignments, should you choose to accept it, is to spend more time learning what you need to know to understand the news. That means history, political science, geography, economics. These will let you understand if what you're getting from the news is shit or shinola. Read things that make you angry. Watch things that aren't true and take time to research why these untruths become so popular. Plug into the narratives around us and make distinctions between what is actually factual and what is not. In other words, commit to the journey it takes for us to understand our divided nation. That's something no reporter can do for you. You have to do it for yourself. I'll see you on the road. Thank you.